doing. Would you join me in giving her a UK Wildcat welcome? Terry, thank you for that wonderful, wonderful introduction and for really focusing on the work of the Casey Foundation. I am um, honored on behalf of the foundation to be here and to talk to you about a very small issue called disconnected youth, which is actually a huge, huge national challenge. I'm more honored to see the number of students we have who have taken up um, work in the College of Social Work and have really found their passion in that field. Um, there are so many challenges that face our country that require the type of, of, of passion and determination and curiosity that you bring. So I'd like to thank each and every one of you for being here. Um, I had the opportunity to have lunch with Ann Rosenstein and it was such a pleasure uh, to, to meet the legacy um, of Irma Rosenstein, who I never had the honor of meeting. Uh, but I have to say, I, I did a little Google search on her. I can, I can still do that. Um, and was just fascinated uh, by how much she's accomplished. And understanding that legacy and the legacy of this series, I have to say that it's just such, a, such an honor to be here. Uh, Patrick McCarthy, our CEO, sends his regards. If it was at all possible for him to be here, he would absolutely um, have been here to welcome you and give these remarks. Um, but I, I, I am honored to give them on his, on his behalf. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I'm going to tell you, because I think that's a, a good way to have the conversation. Um, at the Casey Foundation, as Terry mentioned, we're a big believer in data. So I have to give you one data point, which is that these lights are blinding me, so I can't really see you, so I'm, I'm just going to assume that, that we're on this walk together. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking through the data around the issue of youth and young adults, in particular, disconnected youth. This is not a test on facts and figures, but it's one way to think about the magnitude of the challenge and the implications for our country if we continue to let it to move forward. We're gonna, then going to shift the conversation to sort of why do we think the problem exists? And then finally, we'll turn around and, and talk about what are some of the solutions that are out there and how we can all play a role in those solutions. A couple of years ago, the Casey Foundation uh, put out a report called Race for Results. And as part of that effort, we developed this continuum of developmental milestones. And it became a framework for how we think about um, children from the earliest years on through adulthood. And I, I should say children, that shows my age, right? So it's really youth and young adults very broadly that we're talking about. And so we developed a set of indicators um, related to each one of those developmental milestones. And this was build, building on some work that the Brookings Institute did with looking at those things that were most likely to determine whether someone would be middle income by middle age. Not whether or not you would be wealthy, but whether or not you could aspire to be middle income by middle age. So there are 12 indicators that are up here, and they range from whether or not a baby is born at low birth weight. Uh, Terry talked about reading on grade level by third grade, which is a critical indicator. Um, on through completion of high school on time, whether or not you earn a post-secondary degree, and whether or not you're able by the age of 24 to be employed and really to earn uh, what we think of as a family-sustaining wage. So that's the continuum as we think about the development of children from the earliest years on through adulthood. The things that we like to um, hold ourselves accountable for having impact on. And as a country, we measure our, our productivity we measure our um, success in lots of different ways. As a foundation, we really believe that the, 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 the measure of success of the country is the measure of the health, the overall health and well-being of its children. And we'll have the best sense of whether or not we can continue to prosper when we know how well the, the youngest and the most at risk are doing um, throughout, their, throughout their lifespan. I want to start by, by framing uh, this challenge in terms of a person. Because it's very easy to talk about youth and young adults, we can talk about uh, kids of certain ages, but let's talk about a person and what that person looks like. So let's, let's call this person Dave. Uh, and imagine that you are Dave, 
and you have a high school diploma. You earned your diploma, you struggled through school, you enrolled in one or two community colleges, didn't really work for you, you uh, needed a, a, a pretty heavy amount of remediation, you were racking up some student debts, and eventually you just dropped out. So now you're working in the fast food industry. You work about 20 to 25 hours a week. You're making $9 an hour. Your parents are unskilled laborers as well. You don't have family who've graduated from college. You don't really know where you're gonna go from here. And you don't know how to get back on to the right path so that you can get to the point where you can provide a future for yourself let alone a future for a family that you aspire to have. So where do you go from here? What's your next step? How do you figure out how to get right back on the right path? Or even what resources you have available to you? What if you have a child? What if you're Dave and you also have one or two children that you're caring for? What are the prospects that are available to you and how do you figure out where to go next? As we spend a few minutes talking through the data around youth and young adults, I want you to keep Dave in mind. In fact, I want you to be Dave as you sit in the room. And just to remember that this is the type of individual that we're talking about. It's a real person with a real history and some real challenges. There are 5.5 million Daves in the United States who are currently between the ages of 16 to 24. They're not in school, and they're not in the workplace. I've worked on this issue um, for a number of years in different capacities, and at one time, they were called the forgotten class. Uh, they've been called opportunity youth. But the figure of five million has pretty much been a, con a constant. You, don't, you see the numbers go down a little, but you don't see a lot of movement in terms of the number of youth and young adults that we're talking about. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, because you also have another 14 million who we say are marginally connected to the workforce. Those are the days. You're working part time. You're really not earning enough to sustain yourself. You are in the workforce, so you're not showing up on the unemployment rosters, right? But you're, you're really not making it. You're just struggling to survive. Of that 5.5 million, you have 3.4 million who are what we call chronically disconnected. And that means you've been out of the labor force for at least a year. You've pretty much fallen out of, out of society. Nobody's measuring you. You're not in the education system. You're not in the workforce system. In many ways, you don't exist unless or until you show up in the criminal justice system. And that's the, the basic numbers of individuals that we're talking about. When we look at the profile of who those youth and young adults are, we find that um, minorities, African Americans, Native Americans, Hispanic, um, children of immigrants are faring the worst. In fact, I think half of disconnected youth when we last measured were African American. The rate of disconnection for men and women, young men and young women are about the same. We find that um, immigrants, people who are foreign born, experience disconnection at a slightly higher rate than individuals who are born here in the United States. And what what's, was most striking for me is that the rate of disconnection for young parents is twice the national average. So what does that mean? That means we have a parent who has children, they're not in school, and they're not working, they may or may not be eligible for any form of benefits. So how does this parent care for their kids? And what does the future of these children look like? We also find that youth and young adults who are involved in public systems are among those who are most at risk. And when we think about public systems, we're talking about the child welfare system and the juvenile justice system, and criminal just, juvenile and criminal justice system in particular. And just to look at a, a, a few of the statistics, 45% of young people in foster families at some point experience disconnection. Now what you find is that people move in and out of disconnection. They drop out, they find a part-time job, that job ends, they're, they're in and out. But 
of children in foster families experience disconnection at some point. Another important statistic, 87%, we've seen high school graduation rates increase over the past several years, which is great. There's been a lot of energy and attention around making sure kids graduate from high school. 87% is the national average, 58% for kids who have been involved in the foster care system. And lastly, only half of kids in, in the child welfare system are gainfully employed by the age of 24. Not 18, 19, 20, but 24. So those statistics are startling. You also find that um, young adults who are involved in the juvenile justice system at some point also experience higher rates of disconnection. There, the, the outcomes data, it, it's difficult to collect um, information on juvenile justice. It varies by state what's available. But it makes sense that particularly if you were incarcerated at some point, that in and of itself is disconnection because you're, you're not working and you're not in school. Incarceration in and of itself causes disconnection. There are about, on any day, I think there's about 55,000 kids, youth and young adults, who are incarcerated. And in the system, courts handle about a million cases annually. So we're talking about a really large number of individuals who are at risk of essentially falling out of society. One of the things that we look at is, what, is, what do the numbers look like when you disaggregate the data by race? How is it different for youth and young adults of color versus others? Which is just a fancy way of saying, who is most at risk? And where do we want to target our resources? Now, that targeting is going to vary. If, um, if I'm in Appalachia, it's going to look a certain way. If I'm in Mississippi, it looks a different way. If I'm in California or New Mexico, um, those at risk are going to look very different. But just looking at the data on a national basis, um, we find that black or Hispanic youth are most likely to be disconnected. In, in fact, I think one in four African American and Native Americans are disconnected. We also find that the unemployment rate among Af African Americans and Hispanics in particular trend a lot higher than the national average. And finally, African Americans, Americans are half as likely as whites to attain a bachelor's degree. And we find that's even more pronounced for Native Americans. So when you look at the data on, on those in the workforce, on the connect, the disparities by race and ethnicity are, are truly significant. The other way that the foundation likes to look at the data, which is where do we have, what parts of the country do we see the most problems? And uh, we find that, unfortunately, the Southeast and Southwest comes up all the time. If you look at 25 years of history, you find a high concentration of youth and young adults who are disconnected in that band of states across the bottom of the country. Um, what's interesting is if you look at child outcomes, outcomes for young children, children and families, you see the poorest performance in those same states. And what that tells us, what it indicates for us is that the, the gap in performance, the gap in outcomes for children early in their life just continues to grow as they get older. So the more we can target resources in the earliest years, the better off we are. So if a, if a kid, one way to think about it is if a kid can't read at third grade, they can't do fourth grade math. I have a fifth grader, they're doing word problems. So if you can't read the problem, you can't do the math. They therefore aren't going to be proficient at eighth grade math. They can't do well in high school. The prospects for them entering post-secondary school are low and the ability for them to go on and, and earn a family sustaining wage are likewise low. So part of the reason that you see the consistent data across the bottom of the country is because it, it, it essentially is self-reinforcing over time. Unfortunately, when you look at the trends, you don't see a, a, lot, of, a lot of movement. Um, one of the things that we found is that the uh, rate of disconnection for um, young, for teenagers and young adults, 16 to 19, tends to be a little bit lower than that for those who are 20 to 24. The other thing that you find is a bit more um, movement in um, young adults 20 to 24. And what that accounts for is those who are 20 to 24 are most likely to be Im impacted by macro cycles, by recessions, by period, large periods of unemployment that the country experiences at large. 
youth who are 16 to 19 year, years old are less likely to, to experience those cyclical movements. And so that's why you see more movement in uh, older, the older kids than you see in the younger. The thing that I, I, I want to come back to is, as we think about the data and the facts and figures, is we're talking about people. We're talking about kids, kids in my world. We're talking about young people, teenagers and young adults. We're talking about your neighbors. We're talking about your peers. We're talking about people who are just like those who are in this room. And there are five million of them whose futures are dim today and another 14 million whose prospects are very low. So how do we get here? I feel like I've depressed you after lunch. That's terrible. Um, unfortunately, the data is not encouraging, but it's important to look at how do we get to where we are in order to figure out what is it that we do about it. And this is a, a great quote on the slide that was from a, a, um, a report called Connected by 25. Unfortunately, the, the report was published 25 years ago, which says to me that for 25 years, we've known that there were perils in the transition from adolescence to adulthood. For 25 years, we've known that kids were falling, were sort of falling off the pathway and having a hard time getting back on at that critical juncture. And yet we still have numbers in the millions and we still haven't determined and resolved the challenge. So why is that? This is a, uh, it's a, a pathways model. I have to make fun of my employer for just a minute. Um, this is a pathways model that the, the foundation constructed. We did a report a few years ago, I think it was 2012, called Youth and Work, which looked at the, the challenges of youth in the workforce. And as part of that effort, we developed this model, which is on-ramps and on-ramps, um, starting with when a person enters high school to the different ways that they can move on to having a productive career. And when I looked at it, the first thing I said is, hmm, this is clear as mud, right? <laughs> it's, uh, aside from the fact that this picture is, is not clear, this isn't something that's posted on the walls of the counselor's office. It's not something you can find in your community center. This is an interesting mental model that we have for how people like you uh, move from high school and throughout life. But it's not something that we hand out in classes to say, okay, here's what you do. You go to high school, if you're running into problem, you go and, and you talk to your counselor. If you drop out, then you probably want to go get a GED or you want to get some other types of credentialing. You want to get back on that yellow, that yellow line that yellow line is really important. That's how you get through life. Or you might choose to go to a community college or get some credentialing. I mean, these are great ideas and they're, they're real programs. But it's for those who don't have the adults in their lives, the parents, the social connections that really guide them along that path, it's hard to know how to get on and how to get off. So that's the first problem, which is there is a, a pathway, but it's not clear. I want to applaud those of you who are students in this room because you have figured it out. You've either figured it out on your own or you figured it out with the help of your parents or your, your siblings, your cousins. You figured out how to move along that pathway. But there were probably some roadblocks along the way, places where you stumbled. Maybe you were like me and you got to the financial aid office and they said they didn't have your financial aid forms and so you were a little short that semester and not sure where to go from there. Um, you know, maybe you had to get a job to work through, through school. Lots of things that, that can happen. But for some kids who don't have, particularly those who don't have those supports, those, those roadblocks lead to permanently moving off the path without the real knowledge of how to get back on. And that's the second challenge, which is the, the, the lack of guidance, the lack of resources, the lack of, of, of social connections to help those who are falling off to get back on. The last challenge in terms of, of why we believe youth are, dis, are disconnecting is particularly for the, most, the youth who are most at risk, there are lots of systems that serve them. 
Um, we talked about the child welfare system, there's the juvenile justice system, there's the education system. In some cases, there's health and human services. L lots of public systems that touch the lives of these kids. Uh, public systems don't always play very well together. They don't always coordinate uh, very well. So they're all serving the same kid. If Dave was in the child welfare system and got stopped for some minor offense, he's in the child welfare system and the juvenile justice system. He should be in school every day, so he's in the education system as well. Unfortunately, those systems aren't talking to each other, so it's very, very easy um, for a kid not to get the level of services and, and support that they need. The good news is that we are seeing some communities where we're seeing more coordination. Um, across and among the systems, not a lot, but we are seeing some. Um, the better news is we're finding that there are public systems who realize that in order to function well, they need to engage the young people who are involved in the systems in creating the solutions. And that to me is a very, very promising trend. There's a, there's a fancy word, uh, it'll come to me sometime before I, I wrap up, but it's a, it's a, a way of engaging young people who've been impacted by the system and coming up with solutions to the problem that the, system, the systems face. And that's probably one of the most promising trends that we're seeing in terms of helping systems to coordinate with each other. So thinking about um, what can we do. Terry was very kind to me and, and to my colleagues when he talked about the work of the foundation and the resources we provide. In many ways, our work is easy. Uh, we take data and we take information, we communicate, we make information broadly available. Um, the most important thing that we do is fund organizations like Terry's so that they can go out and really do the work on the ground. They can do things around influencing policy. They, they, they and hopefully individuals like yourselves when you move on with your career, um, can be a part of the system. Our job is to invest in what works. And we've seen a lot over the past uh, couple of decades around what does work. We know that pathways work. We know that when we as adults are conscious about creating steps in a process that young adults can follow and about making it clear what the steps in that process are, then kids do well. We know that when we provide wraparound supports in the workplace, that kids and young adults do well. We know that taking a sector-based approach to employment, that is, we're gonna provide training in fields where there are jobs. We know that works, so that we're not training you for jobs that don't exist. So we have a really good idea of programs that work and approaches that work, and the number one thing that that we can do from a solution standpoint is invest in what we know works, invest in those programs that work, and really try to, try to bring them to scale so that they can reach more kids. But there are lots of other, in addition to funding what works, there are other solutions. Um, one of them which has gotten very, uh, very popular is um, um, investing in collaboratives. Collaboratives is a big fancy word. Uh, it, it really means investing in organizations that work well together, that can sit in a room together, that can share data and information, that can be six or seven organizations that are part of, that have a common goal in mind, that use common systems, that hold themselves accountable for a common set of indicators. Investing in collaborative approaches is one of the things that we know works. Scaling up effective programs we talked about. Social enterprise and entrepreneurism. Not every, not every kid is going to be able to qualify for a job. There's a real gap between the skills that, are, are, um, that we're equipping our young people with and the skills that the labor market is requiring. And so we've seen a real movement around creating entrepreneurial opportunities um, so that if someone doesn't necessarily have the formal skills, they can start creating an opportunity of their own. Um, the, the private sector, employers are big, a big, big part of the, the solution. Um, it's, a, it's a real challenge when you're, I come from a for-profit background and when you work for a for-profit organization, 
your job is to make money for your shareholders. The people that you are accountable to are not only the people in the room, but they are the people who invest in your company, and you are very focused on that as your bottom line. And quite frankly, that's how you keep your job, is by making sure that your shareholders are happy. But there's a broader role for employers um, in really engaging deep, deeply in the community. And we're starting to see more and more where employers recognize that young people really are their future workforce. And they recognize that there is not only a social good um, by providing the services and supports for youth and young adults who are coming into their programs, but there's a, there's a bottom line good. There's a lot of, um, there's a, a, a lot of goodwill that conveys when you bring someone in, you give them the skills and you give them the wraparound services and supports that they need. One of the other um, approaches that is showing some promise is two-generation approaches. We talked about the, the fact that young parents disconnect at a rate that's twice the national average. We need to provide services not to both the parent and the child. So it's great that um, as a young adult, I'm able to get the training and I'm able to get a job, but if I have a child, that child also needs to be enrolled in preschool, and there are lots of child care challenges for those of us who have kids and have, who've survived the preschool years um, that come with, with being able to work. So we really need to be able to provide services that provide academic or educational opportunities for the children, as well as opportunities to work for the parents. And those are just some of the, the practice solutions that we have in play and that, that we believe have some promise. And lastly, but, but certainly not least, are policy solutions. Um, the good news is we've seen a lot of, of investment, of research, of organizations over the past, I don't know, anywhere from five to 10 years that have come into play. Um, the White House Council for Community Solutions was commissioned in 2010 uh, by President Obama, and they chose the issue of disconnected youth. I think that they were chartered until 2012 is when they disbanded. But they brought a tremendous amount of attention to what is the, the societal cost, the real hard cost of having youth and young adults who are not in the workplace. And, and there is a cost in terms of lost productivity for the individual, but there's also a cost in terms of um, generally, a, a, disconnected youth will at some point show up in the criminal justice system. So there is a cost associated with that. There, there's a cost associated um, with lost productivity for the country. There are lots of different hard and soft costs um, associated with those individuals, and that was one of the things that the White House Council did. Out of that council came um, uh, the Opportunity Incentive Program that was housed by the Aspen Institute. There's a tremendous amount of policy that happens on, on um, the background through that work, and, and policy really is the vehicle through which we can have large-scale impact. No matter how many programs we have, the, the, the roadblocks and the barriers are really addressed by, um, by policy solutions in, in the work that um, Terry and others are doing. Um, we, we've seen um, just this, this past year the WIO authorization. Um, Many of you, we all, as the uh, Workforce Investment Act reincarnated, it's now the Workforce Investment and Opportunities Act, I believe. Uh, but a large percentage of the funding that was appropriated with that act was specifically for the issue of disconnected youth. Now, the proof is always in the pudding between when the money is appropriated at the federal level and how it's spent at the state, state and local level. So we have a lot of organizations that are really involved with the workforce investment boards within states to try to make sure that those resources are used to do what they were intended to do. But we're seeing a lot of, of policy solutions um, come to bear, but there's still a, a, a lot more um, work that needs to be done, not only on the workforce side, but also on the system side. Uh, to make sure that we're not, we're not youth, losing youth and young adults. And lastly, but I think most importantly, is this idea that young people are part of the solution, and in many ways are, are, are the most important part. You now, we have to do more around engaging um, those impacted by the system in solving the problems of the system. Terry jokes that uh, national foundations, we, we have a, a, a long, sordid reputation for them, 
coming in on high with great solutions and bringing them to communities and saying, okay, make this work because you know it worked in Tougaloo, Mississippi, so we know you can do it here too, right? Um, but I, I think from a systems, from a public system standpoint, and, and we kind of do the same. We assume that we know what's best for kids without asking them, what is it that's going to work for you? How is it that you got to where you are? And what is it that we can do differently to both help you from the place where you are, but more importantly, to make sure that other kids don't end up in that same place? So engaging young people in the solution is, is I, I think, one of the most important things that we can do. Um, the Casey Foundation uh, has taken up the cause of closing all youth prisons. Uh, we don't believe kids should be in jail. Period. I don't believe my kids should be in jail, and therefore I don't believe any child should be in jail. Part of what we have to do is reduce the feeder systems. If we know that individuals in the juvenile justice system have long-term poor outcomes, have long-term inability to find and get a job that's going to enable them to support themselves, we have to find alternatives. There is nothing that shows that incarcerating children makes them better, more productive adults or makes society safer. In fact, the, the data and research suggests exactly the opposite. When you put a kid in jail, you create a criminal. And so we have to do something to reduce the, the feeder systems. We, uh, we did a, a panel with about 15 individuals who had been disconnected at some point and who all were either in school or working. They had all either been in the juvenile justice system or in foster care at some point. They were black, they were white, they were Native American, they were Latino, they, they were a spectrum. And they brought this whole concept um, to us about feeling forward. And what they said is, um, when, you're, when, you're, when you feel vulnerable, you don't want to fail. And when you don't have a lot of resources, failing means you can't move forward because you don't know how to get past that point of failure. We need tolerance in our systems so that kids can fail and build on that failure in order to move forward. My kids have that ability because when they fail, I swoop in like the cavalry and I talk to the teachers or I teach them how to advocate on behalf of themselves or we figure out what additional projects that they can take on. But that's the role that I play for them. We have to have the flexibility in our systems and in the people who are in those systems so that kids have the ability to fail and continue to move forward so that a roadblock doesn't become an off-ramp um, for the kids who are the most vulnerable. The concept of permanence. Um, a lot of disconnected youth, not only do they not have families, they don't have social connections. They don't have coaches or mentors. They don't have generations ahead of them who are educated. They don't have someone who says, I know you didn't do the homework. You need to go to class anyway. And by the way, if you email the teacher before you show up, that's a really, really good thing. They don't have the, the guidance um, that many of us have the luxury of having. So that concept of permanence. We would like to believe that we're going to be able to find a family for every child. We know that every child should have a family. But even if we can't find a family, and sometimes those situations are outside of our control, we have to find the social networks. We have to give young people the tools and the resources to build those social connections and those social networks because in many ways, if you don't have a family, that is what is going to sustain you. And so we have to broaden our thinking around not abandoning the traditional sense of permanence, but adding on to it, if you will. Um, the whole concept of trauma. Uh, Casey did a study a few years ago about toxic stress and what's the impact of toxic stress um, on families and children. But there's a ton of research and data and evidence and programs about trauma-informed care. And I think building what we know works around trauma-informed care is a huge component to really being able to stem this problem. And the last thing that I'll say, and, and probably the only thing I've said today that's of real significance, 
is we all have a role to play. And I'll, I'll say that again, we all have a role to play. We had a panel this morning, and, and one of the things that, that I acknowledged is um, I probably wouldn't be a really good social worker. It's, it's, uh, it, it requires an emotional ingenuity that's above and beyond what I feel like I'm capable of. Um, there are many of you in this room who will be brilliant as social workers. There are many of you in this room who will be brilliant at policy, there are many of you who probably already are brilliant at policy. There's a role for each and every one of us to play in helping to solve this problem, and we really have to figure out what is our, what is our seat at the table? How is it that we can contribute, and what is it that we feel called to, to do in order to resolve, um, to resolve the problem? Uh, and that's really what I, what I wanted to leave you with, is, is the thinking around, if you're Dave, what do you need, and who do you need, and what is it that you as an in individual could contribute to Dave if you were in that situation? Thank you.